Let's open our Bibles this morning to Ezra chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Ezra chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, of the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra, We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath. Let's pray. Our Father, teach us in this hour. Teach us from Your Word. Let Your Spirit take the Word of God and implant it within us. Show us how we should act. Show us how we should live. And above all, Increase our love for You. Teach us to love You more. Let us see the excellencies of Your grace. The overwhelmingness of Your redemption. Because God, You are great. And You are greatly to be praised. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This this week we will focus on the final verse of this paragraph, that's verse 5. It says, Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath. Most of you will recall that before this, Ezra, upon finding the extent of the Jews' sin in marrying the idolaters of the land, he had cast himself down in front of the temple in prayer. And it was a prayer of confession for the sins of the people. It was a prayer of intercession for them to recognize the grave nature of that sin. You may also recall that over the last several Sundays, we have looked at the answer that God has given through a man who appears only once in the Scriptures, the man Shechaniah. We have seen him correctly diagnose the problem. That these marriages were at their heart invalid because even making them violated the law of God. That nothing in these so-called marriages was something that God had Himself joined together. And with that understanding, He prescribed the correct solution to express the repentance of God's people. And that was to leave those marriages with the idolaters behind. And even in this, he recommended not simply turning the idolaters out, but graciously giving them a divorce according to the law. This was a measure of grace to keep the idolatrous woman from disgrace, such as being accused of harlotry. And finally, he delivered God's commission to Ezra himself, saying, Arise, for it is your task, and we with you. Be strong and do it. We looked last week at the ones to whom the task had fallen, and that was Ezra and we with you. And so then when we reach verse 5, we are at the ending of this instruction and calling through Shechaniah. But we see this verse also stands at the beginning of the implementation of God's remedy for this grievous sin. And I use the term remedy deliberately. It's God's prescription of fixing the sinful state His people have walked headlong into. Beloved, God has no interest in the sin of your life 
except to cure it completely. God has no interest in the sin of your life other than to remove it from you, to save you from it. He doesn't want to make you feel better about your sin, to make you feel better as a person even in your sin. He doesn't want to make you feel better about yourself as you continue to chase your sin. He doesn't want to see you smiling to yourself while you confess your sin to Him. Smiling because you know that you have every intention to return to that same sin at the next opportunity. And the only reason you're confessing now is to relieve yourself of some guilt to make yourself feel better. Of all the failings of our North American churches, this, I think, would be the greatest. In this church, I would dare say, there is too much justification of sin and too little deadly battle against it. In a very real sense, we have been lured to the same idolatries that lured the Jews of Ezra's day. Many of us have not made it our mission, our quest to discover even one sin a week in our own hearts and put it to death by whatever means are required. We have not made it the purpose of our lives to find those sins that still dwell in us and remove them, to put them to death. We've been taught in our churches to look at other people's lives, to discover others' sins and thereby serve each other. But if that's the only work against sin that we do, we become merely the Pharisee proclaiming our righteousness before God and declaring, I thank you that I'm not like other people. It is a truly dismal state if we ever allow ourselves to feel better about our own sin than we do about the same sins in others. And if we secretly love the sin, even as we're asking for forgiveness, that is not what confession means. We all know 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that word confess there means literally to speak the same way of. So what it means is that when we repent and confess, we recognize our sin as God sees it and treat it with the same revulsion and hatred that God has for it. I'm not talking about other people's sins. I'm talking about our own. Each one of you, as you see sin in your life, Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death what is earthly in you. Most often, though, we don't realize the odiousness of sin, the stench, the stink that, that it has upon us. We don't recognize early enough the corruption and decay it works upon us, rotting us from the inside out. We're not repulsed by sin. We don't detect the odor of death on it because we become used to it. But that is how God sees even those sins we consider tiny. They are an offense to Him. Years ago, I was driving my new pickup truck out in the Midwest. And we stopped for lunch at a delicious cafeteria restaurant out there. We went inside, had an enjoyable meal. And then as I came out, I noticed a lot of flies around the bed of my truck. When we had gone inside, we had parked near another truck with a horse trailer attached to it. It was gone now. When I looked into the bed of my truck, someone had taken a pile of horse manure from that trailer and put it in the bed of my truck. To this day, I remember the horror and the repulsion I felt at the corruption of my truck. Anger, hatred, even mourning, violation. 
And I realize that God has some of those feelings and more over the sin that pollutes our lives after He sent His Son to free us from sin. After He had made us new. Certainly His grace is sufficient to cleanse us from all sin if we are in Christ. But in battling against sin, God doesn't do half measures. Man comes up with half measures, particularly when he really doesn't want to give up the sin. We come up with all sorts of ways. Well, I'll cut back. I won't sin quite so often. I'll take a baby step. So when God led Shechaniah, Ezra, and all Israel to put away the idolaters from their families, this was a complete break from the sin that had infiltrated their lives. Because there is no amount of sin that God is good with. There is no amount of sin that God is good with. He doesn't look at us and say, well, humans will be humans. He doesn't call from heaven when He sees us reveling in sin, saying, now I'm going to give you until the count of three to obey. One, two. He's patient. But each sin, even in His children, will exact consequences and chastisement. Hebrews 12, 7 says, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And then later on in that same chapter, in verse 11, it says, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. That is God's goal when He removes sin. He doesn't want to make you a little bit better. He wants to make you righteous in Christ. It is the work of sanctification. The work of making you more like the image of Jesus Christ. When God talks about sin, He tells us things like Romans 6.6 6, that our old self was crucified with Jesus in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Or 6.11, where he says to consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Matthew 5.29-30, when Jesus spoke of sin, He says, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Now on this, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time. What Jesus is saying here is not that He desires one-eyed, one-handed followers. You and I both know that your eye doesn't make you sin. We know that your hand doesn't make you sin because both parts are guided by one thing, and that is your heart. Both of those members are guided by your will. They're guided by your heart. They're guided by that earthly nature that is still in you. And so what Jesus is saying here is really to have no limits in your striving against sin. To do what it takes to put to death the things of the flesh. Because for some, giving up a sin that has been practiced until it has become an addiction is often all but unthinkable. But putting away our sin or the temptations to them is no more unthinkable than God sending His only Son into the world to be the propitiation for sin. So that God Himself would be just and the justifier of those who have faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. You think it's difficult to give up your sin. 
God did the unthinkable and sent His Son. We never saw that coming. Those who studied the law never recognized who Jesus was. Only now, when we have the whole picture, do we realize the extent of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now you may be saying that's all well and good, but what does that have to do with Ezra? Particularly the oath he exacted from the people around him. It's a fair question. To remind everyone, our text today is this. Arise, for it is your task, and we with you. Be strong and do it. And then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath. I would ask you, why did Ezra make the people around him take an oath to do what had been suggested by Shechaniah? As soon as Ezra got up, he could have just said, okay, here we go. And then been along with his business because the task is his. But when Ezra arrived, if you recall, he didn't bring chief priests with him. He didn't bring an abundance of Levites with him. Remember, he had to go do some special recruiting to get the Levites to come along. The people who had gathered around Ezra here, around his confession, who were weeping with him, were the people who were already in the land when Ezra arrived. They were part of the problem. It was their own sin that Ezra was confessing, that Ezra was praying for. These people who stood around weeping with Ezra had either turned a blind eye to the sin of the people, in some cases may have assisted in the marriages to the idolaters, or had condoned or comforted those who had committed these sins. That's the reason Ezra exacted the oath. They had to repent first. If Ezra did not truly have these leaders with him, they would have sabotaged him at every turn. Telling the people who were found guilty of this sin that they would have shelter from God's law, from God's judgment, that they didn't have to fear God, nor did they have to obey Him, that they, those leaders, would accept them even in their unrepentant sin because they were more open-minded than God was. We hear those satanic lies all the time from liberal denominations who consider themselves enlightened when it comes to sin. When they consider themselves more modern and accommodating to sin than the Bible is. But the Bible is the Word of God Himself to teach us everything we need for life and for godliness. And so if you are captured in sin, please hear the true gospel that God knows your sin and He stands ready to forgive it all through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. All He calls you to do is to follow in faith, allowing Him to relieve you of the sin and the guilt that you've been carrying. He doesn't love your sin. He came to free you from your sin. Sin is not your pet. Sin is your jailer. And so He crushed it, destroyed it, crucified it on the cross of Jesus Christ. Your greatest need, no matter what your sin, is not for someone to love your sin. It is not for someone to accept your sin. Your greatest need is someone to free you from your sin. 
and make you right with God. And Jesus Christ has done that if only you believe in Him. There are many out there peddling a false promise that God wants you to be healthy, happy, and wealthy. But the Word of God says that God wants to make you free. Free from sin and alive to Him. Free from hopelessness and joyful in Him. Free from guilt and overcoming sin in Him. Believers, that is the gospel message we also need to hear every single day. That is the gospel, the good news we must live in every day. Those leaders in Ezra's time had forgotten the holiness of God. So they had become comfortable in the society of idolatry. Much as Lot had become comfortable in the land of Sodom. And so when Ezra rose up from the ground as he was bidden to do, Ezra looked immediately to them and asked them, in effect, are you ready to do God's will now? 1 Peter 4.17, we read it this morning in our New Testament reading, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? The confession of Ezra, this chosen man of God, had accomplished its task. It had brought these men before the throne of God. The intercession that Ezra had made had been answered by God in the hearts of those who gathered around Him. And so the Scripture tells us simply, they took the oath. An oath is a solemn vow before God. A promise made before the one who never forgets. Each Sunday, we come to this table and declare by taking the bread and the cup that we are His, that our hearts belong to Him alone. We declare that our sins are forgiven solely by the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ and not by any righteousness of our own. We declare that our hope is in Him alone. Hope for righteousness before God, for sanctification through His Spirit, and for our ultimate glorification when we will be with Him forever. But here, we are in a battle. There is sin in every life in here. I'm not looking at you and saying, I know what those sins are. I'm looking at you and saying, God does. The Spirit He has given you will show you those sins. Ask Him each week to show you a sin that you need to work on that week. That you need to put to death that week. That you need to crucify that week. Because too many Christians believe that we're okay. We're in good shape. We're all prayed up. We're not. Every one of us struggles. And too many of us fall because we haven't continued putting to death the earthly things in our lives. Continuing the work of Jesus Christ who has freed us from that sin. Let's pray. Our Father, forgive us because we have found it comfortable to live in the land of idolatry. 
we found it comfortable not to look at our own lives and ask, what's the next thing I need to kill? What's the next sin that needs to be removed from my life? God, I think that's why we don't love you the way we do, the way we should. Because, God, we're not putting to death those sins. We're patting ourselves on the back. We're thinking we're in good shape. We even let the enemy call us over and say, why don't you rest from getting rid of sin for a while. Father, while the world world remains for us, let us never lay aside the sword that you have given us. Let us never rest or flee from the battle that you have set before us in our own hearts. Let us never think for a moment that we have made it. But let us strive on, reaching out for the prize, buffeting our body to bring it under submission to the Holy Spirit teaching us to recognize sin before it even starts. And God, never let us call ourselves mature. We simply want to hear from your lips as we stand before you. Well done. You are a good and faithful servant. Nothing in this is extraordinary. Everything in sanctification is exactly what you intended. break our attachment to sin. Break our love for this world. And Father, increasingly make us immune to the temptations that would draw our eye or draw our heart to make us follow the lusts of this world. We ask all these things in the name of the overcoming Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, who sits at your right hand, our high priest, the firstborn, forever. Amen.